supposed to get ready for this hunt for this young man here. We gotta get the gear all set. Head out probably about five in the morning. So we should give us enough time to get there before daylight. There it's up to you guys. So we'll wake up pretty early. I like to wake up like three o'clock myself. <laughs> so from there we go to Tim's. After that we hit the mountain. Make sure everything's clean, your gear. Your rifle's nice and clean. You want to have a backfire or misfire. Safety first out there when you go out there. It's, it's a dangerous place and you're a long way from home, so you got to be prepared. Have the ammo ready, usually 270 or 308, 30 odd six. Yeah. That's the most important thing you got to wear out there. Hunter's orange. To say one of us went in there and then you're expecting the moose to come out. What if your buddy comes out with no? Uh, you know, Hunter's orange on, it's going to be gone. That happened to me a couple of years ago when I saw a cow up on the side of the mountain. And at the bottom of my scope, I noticed this guy this guy moving up. I'm going to take my gun away. He had no Hunter's orange on. Really? None at all. Yeah, he had camel gear. gear. That's the importance of wearing that orange. So you'll know that somebody is there. So when we get up to the mountain, and we do our ceremony and make our offering at the bottom before we go way up. This is part of the process that our people did a long, long time ago. Prior to the 1920s, the uh, Mi'kmaq hunted and fished and, and gathered the way they always did, uh, supplying food for their family, uh, gathering materials to trade. In my days, my father and my mother, every morning my father went out to hunt, looking for food for today's meal. I grew up with my grandparents. I started trapping when I was 12 years old, and I'm 71. People always showed me uh, what's enough. I mean, what, what to take and what not to take, and, and when, to, when, when you meet your quota or whatever, I think they all had a plain idea what you only need. So I learned early that uh, half a dozen uh, uh, eels was just good for our family, but maybe take three or four more for, you know, for another family. To share, to share everything. And, you know, this is what's been passed on to us. We have to provide for those who cannot provide for themselves. And then we have to understand that the resource we're taking has to be used to its maximum capacity. I'm not going to take a, a, a forbearing animal for its fur alone, you know. I think the, the meat and whatever uses you can take from it. So we'll use the antlers, we'll use the hooves, we'll use the hide, you know, and the meat. So very little is left. And what we do leave there is left for the eagles and the crows and the ravens to feed off and the coyotes and bobcats. So very little, if anything, has gone to waste. You would not want to waste them because you have a valuable, they're valuable to you. I guess it's a native way, we call it a native way, uh, a second nature to us. When we take ownership or we claim ownership of anything, we like to preserve it, we like to protect it, we like to nourish it, we like to provide for it uh, in the same way that it provides for us. In the 1920s, uh, Nova Scotia enacted the first uh, wildlife and game laws. Uh, so it was really the first time that things like licenses and seasons and uh, bag limits started coming into play. Many elders in the communities had still hunted, had still fished, had still gathered, had still kept the traditions alive. Oftentimes they had to do it in secret. Oftentimes they had to do it, uh, you know, dodging DNR or dodging DFO. I used to hunt with some older folks, uh, Raymond Cope and Arthur Cope. And and they were always kind of like outlaws in their old days. They hunted moose, they shot deer, and they understood understood they had rights and operated under the radar of the authority by hunting and fishing and gathering, just taking it home and feeding and sharing it to the people. And that's the way we hunted. We're in the woods. We'd, if we'd see a stranger, we'd just kind of run like the deer and hide or just be not seen. You know, the ceremonies that we do beforehand, no, that has to be done too. Yeah. Your offerings, yeah. We pray. We ask these animals to present themselves to us. We 
we make that offering of our food, tobacco, our drink, whatever we have there, we offer a bit of that. But we always acknowledge the ancestors who have gone before us, the ones in the east. This is where the children sit, the same with the south, where the women sit, and in the west is where the men sit, the protectors, the providers, that's their duty. And in the north, that's the elders. That's the elders. We honor these people. They're the reason why we're here today. These people who have gone before us, our ancestors. No Gabriel Silliboy, who was Grand Chief at the time, uh, was up uh, hunting muskrat in, in Cape Breton, like he always did, and was uh, charged uh, by DNR officers at the time. From then on, it was a constant battle between the Mi'kmaq and um, the Crown. It was illegal for us to hunt, legal for us, in essence, to be a Mi'kmaq person. Finally, in the 1980s, with the changes to the Constitution, um, Jimmy Simon was out hunting uh, deer. Uh, was charged by uh, DNR officers for hunting with uh, out of license uh, and finally the treaties went back to court. So it, it was a very much a tense time between, between provincial government and enforcement officers and the Mi'kmaq because the provincial policies didn't recognize Mi'kmaq hunting and, and the, the Mi'kmaq were, were very much asserting and defending their, their treaty rights. In 1990 was the, the Moose case. The Mi'kmaq finally decided that no there was a right for the Mi'kmaq to go up to Hunter's Mountain and hunt moose. The Grand Council and the bands at that time said, we're going to go up and hunt. The chiefs that gathered around told us to go up there and do the hunt, get charged, so we can take the matter into court and deal with it. First day that they had gotten up here, DNR was ready for them. You could see just a little ways from where you're standing at, you could see the officers were looking, looking right at us, so we knew we were going to get, won't get checked anyway. There were. 20 to 30 individuals charged. The case went to court, but eventually was dropped because the province finally realized that no, the Mi'kmaq did have the rights to do what they wanted to do. So at that time is when the Mi'kmaq really gained the right to come up to Hunter's Mountain and start harvesting moose. I sat on the committee with the chiefs. I was a chieftain. We talked about tags and seasons, and, and, and the chiefs agreed to sign an agreement with the province on hunting moose. We brought back a number of tags to each community. We held a meeting uh, with the hunters and uh, said, anybody wants to hunt moose, so here's a tag. You can go up for a week or a weekend, and if you're successful, great. If not, just pass your tag on to somebody else. When we first started to hunt, it was really good. And uh, like we got around the reserve, and we, we talked about who was going to go. It was a communal type hunt. And everybody enjoyed it. That whole feeling up there um, at that time was, you know, here we are exercising an a newly recognized right that we always had, and we're actually hunting for our community, not for individual needs, but for our community needs. You could see it in everybody. They were actually doing something that they're meant to do. In the Donald Marshall Jr. case, Donald Marshall Jr. was simply looking for a way, again like his ancestors had done, to earn a living and help support his family off the world around him. Again, that ends up in court. I guess after Marshall and, and the recognition to um, fish commercially also applied to hunting and gathering. You know, he commodified a lot of products in the woods. And it began to become individual. Back then it was all about money. If I can get two or three hundred dollars for an animal, then I would shoot you know, 40 or 50, that's what the mentality was of some of the hunters. This was a dangerous place to be in hunting season. There were people everywhere. There were um, lifeguard chairs bolted to the back of pickup trucks with people with rifles on top of them driving up and down the roads, shooting at anything that would uh, appear to be a moose. To hear of some hunters taking 60 and 70 moose out of, their, out of the highlands and then just selling them outright or just taking out the trophy. It was too hard. It was too hard. There were injury and uh, death of hunters. There was a long period of time where, where nobody, um, non-Migma or Migma, were hunting and then that started again. And, and I think part of what happened then, that because to some extent the traditions had been lost. We had individuals up here in Toyota Corollas and uh, sneakers trying to get a moose and trying to find a way to take it home. It was, it was chaos. Within two years, 
None of that was happening anymore. Once the Mi'kmaq said, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, and this is how we're going to start educating and telling our people that we want the hunt to happen, within two years, this became a very nice place for people to be uh, during the hunting season. And I think government looked at that and said, that is remarkable. It's like what that old man told me was the land. Chief Mizell Jaw's father, no old Jaw is his name. He said these guys that call themselves hunters today are nothing but murderers. See, anybody can kill an animal, but do they know what that animal does? Have they actually hunted that animal? And it made me think, what do I know about that animal? You know, what kind of a call to use? Where is he going to run to? Where does he hang out at? Those are the things we need to know. Learn their misbehaviors. Become the animal. This whole process that we have to undergo so that the animal doesn't suffer. It's an honorable kill. Make sure that when you hit him, you hit him in the heart or the head. You might just wound the animal and now we have to go look for him. Put him down on one spot or just Maybe have to travel a couple of hundred feet to get him, but we don't want to be chasing the moose all day because it's too hard. So you can put him out before like yeah. any misery could come? Yeah. In the most respectful kind of way. Exactly, yeah. Because that way there the animal doesn't suffer. Then the work begins. That's where the work really begins. I know that, gee. Last <laughs> time I got... <laughs> yeah. You know the process. So. Yeah, I know the process now. I watch you lots of times. It looks so easy because you just be going through there like just like nothing very fast. But once I did it, it was a whole different story. It's like <laughs> easier watched than done. Like you, you'll just go through, open that, like saw through it and open the moose and get all the guts out, and then we're gone looking for another moose. That's not <laughs> Me, I cut it open. Had to wait for a while, looked over, opened them up, and then oh, it just took long by the time there we had to, it started raining and then Joey had to finish it off. It was the elder harvesters. They began looking at their own communities and saying, if we as elder harvesters have to, we will do what we can to stop the hunt. They were the ones who went in to their chiefs and councils and they went in to Charlie Dennis at Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources and they said, we don't like what's happening out there. They said, at the rate we're going now, there is a lack of respect for the resource in some of our hunters, not all. And there's also a behavior by some of our hunters that's not conducive to sustainability. It's not respectful. It's not sustainable. Really, it's not Mi'kmaq. Eventually, uh, what came out of it was the Moose Management Initiative. The chief said, we want you to go to the communities and ask two basic questions. How would you like to see the Mi'kmaq involved in the management of moose? Also ask the question, what do you have to contribute? So that's what started a number of years of community work, of talking to people and getting from them, how do you want uh, something like a moose harvest to go. So after we went to the communities, it formed the basis of what guidelines should look like. The first round, there was a little bit of mistrust. People didn't know who we were working for. It took a, a good couple of years for the communities to realize that, hey, this is our management plan. This is something that's coming from our communities. When we were in Member 2, uh, an individual said, you know, what you should really do is you should bring all of us together. And so what we created was the Moose Symposium uh, in Wagmancook. There were four basic questions that needed to be looked at very seriously and uh, decisions had to be made. The non-native accompaniment issue, setting up uh, hunter advisory committees on the communities. The seasonality, when we should we be harvesting moose and when shouldn't we be up there harvesting moose. And the idea of livelihood. For two days the delegates from all over Nova Scotia debated these particular issues. And what came out of that was uh, the finalization of our uh, guidelines. And what the guidelines contained was clear indications from the Mi'kmaq community 
that safety was important, that the safety rules that applied to the hunt should apply to the Mi'kmaq. Mi'kmaq should not hunt from January 1st to August 15th. The non-native accompaniment uh, question was important and that it should only be family members and even then uh, non-natives should not be actively shooting animals and uh, really spelling out the idea that hunter advisory committees would eventually be set up in all the communities. The final uh, element was the idea of livelihood. If it's a very healthy moose herd and things are going well then absolutely livelihood should be included. If the moose uh, are in trouble and we need to be careful about it, then we need to reevaluate whether people should be hunting for livelihood. The vast majority of people said, right on. When I saw the, um, the, the, the Mi'kmaq guidelines for hunting, it was really a culmination of a lot of work, a lot of collaboration. Parks Canada, UINR, and the provincial agency set together to, to study moose collaboratively, to share all the information. And when I saw that, that document on the moose guidelines, I really uh, thought it was an important moment. Showing the, that, that tangible progress that 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 uh, that proved to everybody, the, the participants themselves and and the people outside, that that collaboration can work and that uh, that uh, that improvements can be made. And it's now the Mi'kmaq who are taking the lead, only because our community members spoke up and said, "Now is the time for changes in the Highland. Now is the time to make these important decisions today." so that the next seven generations will be positively impacted by our decision. It's been true collaboration. Every, everyone brought something to the table and, uh, and everyone gained something. And, 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 but really, who gained was the moose. Yeah. And when you make that kill, you know, we go up and we smoke with the animal, put tobacco around them, and we ask for forgiveness for what we did. So here we have an animal that um, presented itself as a result of our prayers. So immediately we pray for the uh, spirit of the animal. Here you'll see Danny sets the tone for a pipe ceremony with the animal. There was a circle of tobacco laid down around the animal. Smoke from the pipe, you breathe it into the animal's chest. We touch the animal, let it know that uh, we accept your gift. And what you are doing, you're releasing the soul their spirit going back. So as harvesters, this animal was, uh, was taken and we have to do everything that we can to ensure that the spirit of this animal is aware that we respectfully harvested you on behalf of our people. We ask that forgiveness from the spirit world. We ask that forgiveness from that animal. That's important. What do you think about all the time we took you out there? You think you can manage now? Yeah. So I seen you shoot the moose and I skinned it and gutted it. And I just need my support and back in case I miss it. <laughs> I'm going to be there as backup. You'll have, you'll have a couple other guns there just in case, but it's your first moose. It's your next step. Instead of thinking, wow, oh, yeah, this is going to be my first moose getting off that, I'm going to be thinking, of. Oh, like respecting it, how to put it down as fast as I can. Mm -hmm. That's no. the only way I know how to hunt it. Exactly. He's ready. The biggest thing about this, uh, this initiative is the Mi'kmaq have really stood up in the communities. They stood up and they said, now is the time for us to retake our role as stewards. It is the responsibility of their Aboriginal people to take care of the land, to take care of Mother Earth and to pass these teachings on. The amount of people that were um, against the guidelines or, or felt that no guidelines were necessary uh, started changing their minds because they started saying, you know, the hunt now is a hunt that I'm proud of. It's a hunt that I can take my children up to. It's a hunt that elders feel they can go up to uh, because it's safe and it's respectful. So another thing we're doing this year with uh, harvesters is um, bringing out um, an education uh, plan through our harvester education program and the big issue, the new information we're bringing to our harvesters is the non-lead hunting alternatives. Harvesting animals with lead bullets leaves uh, toxic traces of lead in the meat and in the gut piles which uh, seriously affects human health but 
also uh, contributes to the sickness and death of uh, the birds of prey, especially the eagles. We're asking our harvesters to uh, look at alternatives to uh, stay away from lead bullets as they harvest uh, not only moose but other animals. North of the Cape Breton Highlands National Park, there's a beautiful uh, landscape. Paulette's Cove, Aspie Fault, wilderness area. People were using uh, all-terrain vehicles to uh, take moose out of there and it was a real dangerous practice. We're willing to work with the locals, we're willing to work with government, and we're willing to work within our communities to ensure that uh, ATVs will not be used by any, anybody in this area. Through its protection, we are keeping out machines such as the all-terrain vehicles, which stand to impact permanent uh, damage to this beautiful ecosystem. Another big thing we do up in the Cape Breton Highlands, and everybody looks forward to it, is our annual feast in the Highlands. The feast is usually good, and you get a whole bunch of hunters, and there's brown, and we always invite people. Everybody that's older than me can go first. We have Mi'kmaq harvesters, non-Mi'kmaq harvesters, contractors, enforcement officers, natural resource managers. We have elders and youth and everybody in between come up and we have a traditional feast right there. Everyone look here <laughs> and here. <laughs> we also have um, the youth hunts where communities get together and they bring youth and elders together and they, there's a magic that happens. They go up there and they do their best to harvest moose on behalf of their community. When the young Youths came up to uh, do the hunt. They usually have the elders up there with them, and uh, that kind of helped them how to do the moose hunt, how to clean the moose. We camp up there, and half we go out in the woods, rain or shine, or snowing. We teach them how to skin the moose and clean the moose hide. Messy job, but they do it. They don't mind it. They really want to learn, and some of us really hate to go when Sunday comes. Because we enjoy it so much. I think the very fact that they come here, the f that they're here, and they sit down and they listen and they put their hands into the activities that are provided by the elders, tells me that, yes, they are absolutely willing and wanting to learn and have that care within them. The future is not, doesn't look that bad with them. Ever since I can remember, I was like being out in the woods. I learn new things every time when I go up there. The first time I went, I got addicted to it, like I wanted to go all the time, man. You're killing the moose. That's, that's what happens. But once you do get your moose, you gotta treat it with like respect. A lot of respect because that was another life you took. Every time we'll get one, I'll distribute the meat to show respect for that moose. You distribute its meat amongst your community, making it a part of your community. Elder is pretty much first. Gives them like a good feeling because they know this way hasn't been lost. I was born to do this type of thing because I broke away from sports. I love doing that, but I like this more. I really do because it makes me feel like more back with like my ways, more back with the roots that I have and get the Keep those things going so they're not forgotten. I get to keep it going the right way. Hajine na hajine.